Hi there, I'm a Psych NP and I have 15 test questions for you on SNRIs. Ready? Let's learn Psych fast. Question one, which of the following statements about the therapeutic efficacy of venlafaxine compared to SSRIs is true? A, venlafaxine has been found to be less effective than SSRIs in inducing remission in depressed patients. B, meta-analysis suggests that venlafaxine has similar efficacy to SSRIs in the treatment of depression. C, venlafaxine has demonstrated significantly higher rates of remission in depressed patients compared to SSRIs, or is it D, venlafaxine has been found to be more effective than SSRIs in the acute treatment of depression, but not in preventing relapse? The answer is C, venlafaxine has demonstrated significantly higher rates of remission in depressed patients compared to SSRIs. Meta-analysis of head-to-head studies suggested that fenofexine has the potential to induce higher rates of remission in depressed patients than do SSRIs. This difference in fenofexine advantage is about 6%. DVS has not been extensively compared with other classes of antidepressants concerning efficacy. Question 2. In the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, the extended release formulation of fenlafaxine has been found effective in treating A, excessive worry and rumination, B, obsessive compulsive symptoms, C, panic attacks, D, social avoidance, or E, insomnia, poor concentration, restlessness, and muscle tension. The answer is E. So, this statement accurately describes the core symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder. Insomnia, poor concentration, restlessness, and muscle tensions are the hallmark features of GAD, and the extended release formulation of venlafaxine has been found effective in treating these symptoms. Case reports and uncontrolled studies have indicated that venlafaxine has been beneficial in the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, agoraphobia, social phobia, ADHD, and patients with dual diagnosis of depression and cocaine dependence. It has been used in chronic pain syndrome with good effects as well. Let's go over the incorrect answers. So A, excessive worry and rumination. Um, those are the core symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder, but while venlafaxine may help alleviate these symptoms, the extended release formulation is specifically targeted for aspects of GAD. And B, obsessive compulsive symptoms are not typically associated with generalized anxiety disorder. They are more characteristic of obsessive compulsive disorder, which may require different treatment approaches. And then C, panic attack are considered primarily symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder. So while individuals with GAD may experience panic attacks, they are more commonly associated with panic disorder. The last one was D, social avoidance. Uh, That is more characteristic of SAD rather than GAD. While there may be some overlap in symptoms between GAD and SAD, the primary focus of treatment for GAD is not on social avoidance. Question three. Which of the following statements regarding the therapeutic indication of venlafaxine and desvenlafaxine is correct? A. Venlafaxine is approved for MDD, GAD, social anxiety disorder, and panic disorder, while desvenlafaxine is approved only for MDD. Option B. Desvenlafaxine is approved for MDD, GAD, social anxiety disorder, and panic disorder, while venlafaxine is approved only for MDD. Option C, venlafaxine is approved for MDD and GAD only, while desvenlafaxine is approved for MDD and GAD and social anxiety disorder. Or is it option D, venlafaxine is approved for MDD, GAD, and panic disorder, while desvenlafaxine is approved for MDD, GAD, social anxiety disorder, and panic disorder? The answer is A, venlafaxine is approved for the treatment of four disorders, MDD, GAD, social anxiety disorder, and panic disorder. MDD is currently the only FDA-approved indication for DVS. Question four, which of the following medications is not classified as an SNRI? A, venlafaxine, 
B. Desfenlafaxine, C. Deloxetine, D. Amitriptyline, or E. Levonamelnasopram. The answer is D. Amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is not an SRNI. Instead, it belongs to the class of tricyclic antidepressants, TCAs. So while TCAs like amitriptyline do affect the reuptake of neurotransmitters, they primarily target serotonin and norepinephrine, but they also have significant effects on other neurotransmitter systems, including histamine and acetylcholine. There are currently four SNRIs approved for use in the United States. Venlafaxine, also called Effexor or Effexor XR, Desfenlafaxine, Susnate, also called DFES and Pristique, Deloxetine, going by brand name Sobalta, and Levomelnasopram, brand name Fitzema. A fifth SNRI called Minasopram is available in other countries as an antidepressant, but in the U.S., the FDA has only approved it for treatment of fibromyalgia. Question 5. SNRIs are sometimes referred to as dual reuptake inhibitors due to their blockade of which neuronal transporter? A. Dopamine and serotonin. B. Serotonin and norepinephrine. C. GABA and glutamate. D. Serotonin and dopamine. Or E. Acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Answer? B. Serotonin and norepinephrine. As the name suggests, Inhibition of reuptake of both serotonin and norepinephrine is what the SNRIs do. By blocking the reuptake of these neurotransmitters, SNRIs increase their levels in the synaptic cleft, leading to enhanced neurotransmission and mood stabilization. The SNRIs are also sometimes referred to as dual reuptake inhibitors, a broader functional class of antidepressant medications that include TCAs such as clomipramine, and to a lesser extent, imipramine, and emitriptyline. So what distinguishes SNRIs from TCAs? It's their relative lack of affinity for other receptors, especially muscarinic, histaminergic, and the families of alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. This distinction is an important one because the SNRIs have a more favorable tolerability profile than other older dual reuptake inhibitors. Question 6. What is the incidence of sexual side effects associated with venlafaxine and desfenlafaxine therapy when sexual function is directly assessed? A. Less than 10%. B. Approximately 20%. C. Around 30%. D. More than 50%. Or E. There is no incidence of sexual side effects. The answer is C. Around 30 to 40%. This option accurately reflects the incidence of sexual side effects associated with venlafaxine and desfenlafaxine therapy when sexual function is directly assessed. The side effects are of predominantly decreased libido and a delayed orgasm or ejaculation while taking these medications. Question 7. What enzyme primarily metabolizes venlafaxine in the liver? Is it A, CYP1A2? B, CYP2C9, C, CYP2C19, D, CYP2D6, or E, CYP3A4? The answer is D, CYP2D6. This is the primary enzyme responsible for metabolizing venlafaxine in the liver. Genetic variations in the CYP2D6 gene can lead to differences in the metabolism of venlafaxine and may affect the individual responses to the medication. You know, don't forget, this is also the same enzyme for SSRIs as well. Question 8. Which of the following is a potential side effect of higher dose venlafaxine therapy? A. Hypotension. B. Dry mouth. C. Increased libido. D. Insomnia. E. Sustained elevation of blood pressure. The answer is E. Sustained elevation of blood pressure. This option accurately describes a potential side effect of higher dose venlafaxine therapy. Venlafaxine, particularly at higher doses, has been associated with increased blood pressure, and these elevations may persist over time, especially in susceptible individuals. 
All right, let's go over the incorrect answers. Option B, dry mouth, and then option D, insomnia. You know, they are common side effects of phenlafaxine, but they are not typically dose dependent. It can occur at various doses and it's not really specific to a higher dose of the med. And then C, increased libido. Increased libido or heightened sexual desire is not commonly reported as a side effect of venlafaxine therapy. In fact, sexual side effects usually are of decreased libido or difficulty achieving orgasm. Those are more frequently um, reported side effects from this med. Question nine. How is the extent of absorption of deloxetine affected by food? A, food increases absorption by 10%. B, decreases absorption by 10%. C, increases by 20%. D, food decreases absorption by 20%. Or E, food does not affect the absorption. The answer is B, food decreases absorption by 10%. When deloxine is taken with food, its absorption is reduced by approximately 10%, leading to a slightly lower blood level compared to when it's taken on an empty stomach. Food delays t- the time to achieve maximum concentration from 6 to 10 hours. Question 10. Close monitoring is suggested when using deloxetine in patients at risk for A, renal insufficiency, B, hypertension, C, diabetes, D, hypothyroidism, or E, asthma. The correct answer is C, diabetes. Patients with diabetes may require careful monitoring of their blood glucose levels as deloxetine has been associated with changes in glycemic control, including hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. Close monitoring is suggested when using deloxetine in patients with diabetes, therefore. You know, deloxetine has also been shown to increase blood sugar and hemoglobin A1C levels during long-term treatment. Let's go over the other options of why they're incorrect. Option A, renal insufficiency. Well, that's wrong because deloxetine is primarily metabolized in the liver and its use is not specifically associated with renal insufficiency. However, it should not be prescribed for patients with hepatic insufficiency and end-stage renal disease. A B, hypertension. That's wrong. Um, even though blood pressure should be monitored regularly due to its potential effects on blood pressure, but it's not primarily a, a risk factor that necessitates close margin, specifically when used in deloxetine. It should not be prescribed, though, in patients with uncontrolled neuroangle glaucoma. And then option D and E, hyperthyroidism and asthma, those are incorrect. It's not typically considered as a primary risk factor for requiring close margin, just usual and customary. Question 11. Deloxetine does not appear to demonstrate a dosage response curve, meaning A, higher dose yield, higher efficacy, B, lower doses yield higher efficacy, C, efficacy remains consistent across doses, or D, higher doses are less tolerable. The answer is C. Efficacy remains consistent across doses. So this option accurately describes the absence of dose response curve for deloxetine. Clinical studies have shown that efficacy of deloxetine in treating conditions such as depression and anxiety remains relatively consistent across different doses within the recommended therapeutic range. As provider, you should consider that your patient may have difficulties in tolerability with single doses of above 60 milligrams. So when prescribing like 80 or 120 milligrams per day, consider switching to a 40 or 60 milligram BID to make the drug more tolerable. Um, then option A and B, those are wrong. Higher doses or lower doses will yield higher efficacy. You know, this option suggests that increasing or lower the dose of deloxetine would lead to a higher efficacy, which contraindicates the concept of dosage response curve. And then option D, higher doses are less tolerable. This option suggests that a higher dose of deloxetine are associated with decreased tolerability, which is not necessarily related to the absence of dosage response curve. Tolerability may vary among individuals, but it's not directly related to efficacy. Which statement about milnazapram is accurate? A, it is FDA approved for the treatment of major depressive disorder. B, its efficacy as an antidepressant is well established. C, it is primarily inhibits the serotonin reuptake. D, it has active metabolites. Or E, it is primarily excreted through the lungs.
The answer is D. It has active metabolites. This statement actually describes milnalosuprim as it undergoes extensive metabolism in the liver form and active metabolites that contribute to its pharmacological effects. And let's go over the other answers. A, um, it is FDA approved for the treatment of fibromyalgia only and not major depressive disorder. So that's also why B is incorrect. And C, it's primarily inhibits serotonin reuptake. Um, well, no, it's a serotonin neuroepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, meaning it inhibits the reuptake of both serotonin and norepinephrine, not solely serotonin. And then E, it's primarily excreted through the lungs. Oh gosh, no. It's eliminated through the renal excretion system, which is approximately 55% of the dose being excreted in the urine as unchanged drug and metabolites. Question 14. Levo milnazapram is primarily approved for the treatment of A. Fibromyalgia, B. Generalized anxiety disorder, C. Major depressive disorder, D. Bipolar disorder, or E. Obsessive compulsive disorder. The answer is C, major depressive disorder. This option accurately describes the primary indication for which levomelnazepram is approved. It is FDA approved for the treatment of major depressive disorder in adults. Question 15. Which adverse reaction is not commonly associated with melnazepram or levomelnazepram? Is it A, nausea, B, constipation, C, hyperhidrosis, D, bradycardia, or E, erectile dysfunction? The answer is D, bradycardia. This is not commonly associated with the drug. If anything, it's tachycardia. You know, the most common adverse reaction are nausea, constipation, hyperhidrosis, increased heart rate, erectile dysfunction, tachycardia, vomiting, and palpitations. Rates of adverse effects were generally consistent across the 40 to 120 milligram dose range. The only dose-related adverse effects were urinary hesitation and erectile dysfunction. Alrighty, all done. That completes SNRIs. Go ahead and click on these other videos about bupropion or SSRIs to learn more about depression-related meds. Thanks. Have a good day.